Ja, meine Damen und Herren, Herr Kollege Scheer hat im Grunde schon einen Vortrag über Innovationsmanagement gehalten. Und nur für den Fall, nur für den Fall, dass Sie nicht ganz mitbekommen haben, wovon er redet, was eigentlich sehr unwahrscheinlich ist, schwinge ich mich drei Abstraktionsebenen nach unten und sage, die Innovation handelt im Grunde von drei Dingen, nämlich einmal die Idee, einmal die Umsetzung der Idee in praktikable Produkte und letztendlich mit dem Ziel, damit auch noch Geld zu verdienen. Ich habe eine Fundnote genommen in Respekt zu John, <lacht> a pound note. <lacht> so. Ist das so einfach? Natürlich ist es nicht so einfach. Herr Scheer hat auch schon die Komplexität des Prozesses klar gemacht. Wir müssen auch Geld investieren, um alleine schon auf Ideen zu kommen, die wir dann letztendlich in Produkte und Leistungen umsetzen. Oder wir müssen bei der Technology Push Innovation zunächst einmal Geld investieren, um die Technologien, die wir brauchen, zu entwickeln und uns dann die Frage stellen, was sind die Produkte, mit denen wir letztendlich diese Technologie umsetzen. Übrigens fragen Sie bitte nicht bei Küchenlösch noch so einen schönen Mixer zu bekommen, das war der letzte. <lacht> Meine Damen und Herren, Innovationsmanagement ist ein komplexes Feld und es gibt äh, niemanden, der das besser erforscht als John Besson, der ist weltweit einer der führenden Forscher im Bereich des Innovationsmanagements. Er hat äh, 23 Bücher geschrieben, Zwei Reader, Managing Innovation in der vierten Auflage und Innovation and Entrepreneurship zusammen mit Joe Titt sind die absoluten Klassiker in dem Bereich. Er hat 90 hochrangige Beiträge geschrieben, er hat 64 Book Chapters geschrieben und wir wollen die hochrangigen Referate, die er auf Konferenzen gehalten hat, gar nicht erst zählen. Also wir haben einen Glücksgriff getan, wenn wir mit der Innovationsforschung hier in Nürnberg fortsetzen wollen. Und ich freue mich wirklich sehr und ich bin nicht der einzige, Innovation macht Katrin Möslein, macht Nicole Kuschate, machen etliche Kollegen bei uns. Wir freuen uns mit John Besson gemeinsam zu forschen und um das hier nochmal wieder zum Ende zu bringen, wir wollen gute Ideen entwickeln, wir wollen die Ideen dann auch umsetzen, das ist richtig schön, oder? Und wir wollen dann letztendlich auch nicht monetär, aber dann ideell von der Zusammenarbeit profitieren. Jetzt packe ich mein Innovation Bag wieder ein, denn ich habe ja nur fünf Minuten, von denen viereinhalb schon rum sind. This is a special gift from me, personally, the Innovation Bag. Und, and ladies and gentlemen, the first Schuller Senior Fellowship goes to Professor John Bessent. Ja. Also, ähm, vielen Dank und Frau Schöller, meine Damen und Herren, es ist für mich eine große Ehre, hier zu sein und diese ähm, äh, Fellowship zu kriegen. Vielen Dank. Ähm, obwohl ich komme ganz oft und ganz gern nach Deutschland, obwohl ich trinke auch sehr gern deutsches Bier, Leider spreche ich immer noch nicht genug Deutsch, um meinen Vortrag auf Deutsch zu geben. Ich bitte um Verständnis, ich werde ganz kurz jetzt auf Englisch kehren. Um, and I'd like very briefly to explain a little about my research. But once again, thank you very much for the honor you've bestowed. I want to talk very briefly, and my research is very much about innovation. And the problem with innovation is that it's everywhere. If you look on any company website, I'll give you 30 seconds before you hit, hit that magic word, innovation. You know the kind of thing. Innovation, driving the business. Innovation, working for our customers. Innovation, innovation, innovation. And it's the same in the public sector. Innovation, that's what it's all about. And of course it is. It's about survival and growth. That the trouble is, that innovation can be like one of those other wonderful words, motherhood or apple pie, a good, important thing. But we need to do more than that. The real challenge with innovation is not the idea, 
it's making it happen. It's learning to manage it. Now, here's a very simple map. Uh, you can see the way the axes work. As you go left to right, the world gets more uncertain. It could be political, it could be technological, it could be lots of competition. It gets harder that way. And the vertical axis, how far could we get away with doing what we've always done? Now, I suggest if you put this map in front of a business and say, where is your business on the map? They will say something like this. Don't be stupid. It's obvious the world's changing. We can't stand still. We have to keep moving. We have to change. And that, of course, is why they say these things on their websites and in their strategy documents. Maybe one or two say, hmm, we get it, and they don't. If we're clever, we can use this new technology or these new market rules, and we can create a new world. That, of course, is the aspiration. It's where we want to be. Of course we do. Unfortunately, for many, many reasons, the reality is not always like that. Organizations, although they want to innovate, find themselves below that line. Now, I'm not worried about stupid firms, the ones who blindly don't want to change. They will go very quickly. My concern is with smart organizations, because history tells us even very smart organizations, unless they keep actively managing innovation, may lose direction, may eventually fall below that line. Because the problem is, innovation is a moving target. It doesn't stand still. Of course, it's an old problem. How do we take ideas, the light bulb, and convert them into successful realities? That hasn't changed, but the context has. We've just had a wonderful lecture about this really big change in the world of 2.0. There are things happening there that weren't even around 10 years ago. My daughter lives in Facebook world. I don't understand that. But if I worked in the music business or the entertainment business, I would need to, because that is driving and shaping the world. There are something like 300 million people in Facebook. That is more than live in Mexico. That's a huge country. It's a different world. And in many other ways, the challenge is one of a moving target. And so managing innovation is not a problem we've solved once, we can write textbooks and forget. It's one we need to keep working at. I'd like to suggest that there are many challenges. Let me highlight three very briefly. The spaghetti challenge. Now, by the spaghetti challenge, I simply mean the problem we have these days is not producing knowledge, it's using knowledge. Innovation is about knowledge spaghetti. If you think about it, it's technical knowledge and market knowledge and legal knowledge and financial knowledge. It's knowledge that we weave together, weave that spaghetti together to create new things. And in the old days, we had problems, but there was a limited amount of knowledge. These days today, we don't even know how much knowledge is produced in the world. The best estimates suggest that $750 billion is spent every year in public and private sector research. That's a huge amount of new knowledge coming on stream every year. And it's all over the place. It's not just Germany and Japan and the United States. It's little countries like Taiwan and Singapore and Denmark. We have a global knowledge environment, more and more knowledge coming. It means we have to think very hard about managing the knowledge in terms of where is it, how do we get it. Even the largest firms, people like Procter & Gamble, with $3 billion of spending on R&D, are now saying, hmm, in a world like that, not all the smart guys work for us. We need to connect outside. We need to manage spaghetti out there. So it's a huge challenge, and it's forcing us to think about very different ways of working. Some of them using the internet, some of them using knowledge brokers and gatekeepers, very different relationships to the ones we had even 10 years ago. The spaghetti challenge. The Sappho challenge. Now, don't panic. I am not going to quote Greek poetry. You can relax. But the Sappho challenge refers to a very famous piece of innovation research carried out at my old university, University of Sussex, in 1972. It's an old piece of research, but a very important one, which has been replicated many, many times in many contexts. A really simple piece of research. It basically took an innovation, 
which was launched by two different organizations. One succeeded, one failed. Since the innovation is constant, we can learn a lot about what differentiates the firms in terms of how they managed it. How did they organize and manage the innovation process? It's a very famous piece of research. As I say, it's been repeated many, many times. It does perhaps deserve a prize on its own for the best research name. I asked somebody at Sussex once what SAFO stands for, and they told me, rather embarrassed, it stands for Scientific Activity Predictor by Analyzing Innovations by Studying Their Patterns of Heuristic Origin. Just like that. But leaving the joke aside, the key message from Project SAFO back in the 1970s is that users matter. Understand your markets, and you will be more successful. It's logic. These days, of course, as Professor Scher has pointed out, it's about users being very active players in the innovation system. They are not passive consumers. And so we need to rethink our innovation models, like Lego and Apple and so many businesses are doing, by engaging with users. The Sappho challenge. And the third challenge is the search challenge. We often look in a rather limited way for the innovation opportunities. It's a little bit, however, like the old joke we have in English, I'm sure you have in German, the guy who's hanging on the lamppost. You probably know the joke. You come out of the pub and you see this guy, obviously a little drunk, but very upset. He's hanging on the lamppost and he's scrabbling on the ground. What on earth's the matter? Why are you worried? What's the problem? I've lost my keys. I don't know what I'll do. Okay, relax. I'll help you look. Now, where did you last find them? Where did you last have your keys? And he points to the car park in the distance. They're over there somewhere. Hang on a minute. If the keys are over there, why are you looking here under the lamppost? Oh, because there's more light here. <laughs> I'm not a comedian, but that is a powerful metaphor. Most of our businesses are really good at looking under the lamppost. They know which technologies to research, which competitors to watch, which markets to listen to. And it's precisely not there that the radical, disruptive innovations will be found. They're out there in the darkness somewhere. And there are 360 degrees of darkness. How do we search for that? Well, I'm glad to say my good colleague, uh, Professor Merzlein, and I have worked for some time on that question, and we have some answers, by no means all. But it does surface again, part of this moving frontier, the search challenge. And so we talk in innovation studies about dynamic capability, not just developing a capability, but constantly updating that. We need to learn new tricks. And so the focus, and what I'd really like to talk about very briefly, is the question of how do we learn? Because organizations and researchers need to learn. And I'd like to introduce this gentleman to make a rather important point. Uh, you may recognize, if not, this is Winnie the Pooh, the children's book character. Before Walt Disney, this came out in 1912. And I have this above my desk because I think he says something very wise about the learning problem. Here we have Edward Bear, that's his proper name, coming downstairs now, bump, 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 on the back of his head behind Christopher Robin, which is, as far as he knows, the only way of coming downstairs. Except that sometimes he feels there really is another way, if only he could stop bumping for a moment to think of it. I think it says it so much. That's the real problem, not that we don't want to learn, but most of the time life is too full of crisis to enable that to happen. And so one of the key elements in my research and what I would like to take forward is a focus on how we might learn together in an effective fashion. Now we do know something about how effective learning happens. It's not just books and knowledge in that form, it's actually a cycle. This is a very famous model from the American psychologist David Kolb. Typically, something happens to us, we have an experience, and we try and make sense of it. If we could, we'd stop bumping our heads, step back and think of that. We might then distill some concepts, some ideas, some theories, and mix those with the ones we already have, and then we have something to try out on the world to test. It's a cycle. And that's important because effective learning requires that we visit all the stations. Not just new concepts and ideas, not just blindly bumping our heads, having bad experiences. 
That has powerful messages for the way organizations can learn, in particular if they learn together. If you imagine that cycle, the benefit of learning with other people could be very powerful. Particularly if you share experiences, the good ones and the bad ones, we can learn from that. And I think many of you realize how much more we often learn from failure if we're honest enough to admit it. We can challenge each other in structured ways to reflect, what does that mean? What's going on there? What could we do differently? We can bring new frameworks, new concepts, new models, different people in the room, shared learning. People bring different perspectives to the party. And we can try new things out. We can share the experiments and bring that experience back to feed the cycle. There's a lot of very good reasons why shared learning is powerful. And it's a model we've tried to make use of in the research that we've been doing. It's essentially, though, not a single event, but a process that takes place over time. We've talked about, and what I propose to do with my very uh, honorable fellowship, is to work with the idea of innovation laboratories. And the metaphor is important. In a laboratory, you have the facilities to experiment. You won't always succeed. Sometimes you'll fail, but you'll learn through that. You also can try different things as the research agenda moves. And our idea of innovation laboratories is very simple. It brings together researchers, people from the university world, with practitioners. And we've done this for some time. We're convinced of the power where the promise is we will learn together. Nobody has the answer, but together, as we work at this moving frontier, we can move this forward. We've now got a network, I'm delighted to say, which runs across 15 countries. We involve about 250 companies and about 35 academic partners. I'm delighted to say that the early work that we did began in the UK, in Denmark, and particularly with my good colleague, Professor Merslein, here in Germany. It's a model which we know works. We know that not because, as researchers, we think it's good. It has helped us write a great deal but also because we see this working for the companies, they tell us, and they also talk and learn from and with each other. And so really, I'd like to conclude by saying there is a very serious challenge at the innovation frontier. It's a moving target. There are many, many more challenges than the three I've mentioned. We need to address this, not because it's academically interested, but because it's absolutely fundamental for all of us. We have to manage innovation more effectively. I'd like to propose the Innovation Laboratory is a powerful mechanism for making that happen. I'm delighted to have the fellowship and the opportunity to take this forward. Thank you very much.